Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. Have you ever wondered who decides which writings were included in the Bible? You have all these Hebrew writings from the Old Testament and tons more Greek letters from the New Testament. Who decided which ones were inspired by God? Well, best-selling author Neil Lightfoot outlines the birth of the Bible, tracing the canon of Old and New Testament scripture while analyzing textual variations and even recent translations. Enjoy How We Got the Bible by Neil Lightfoot. Well, let me look over this handsome group. As I say to my students in Abilene Christian, one or two exceptions. I want you to know that we're glad to be here. I want you to know what a great privilege it has been all through my adult life to study Bible manuscripts, translations, and this sort of thing. And then uh, over a period of years to have in print this book, How We Got the Bible. This is my first time to Coeur d'Alene, and we're enjoying it. And I really hope that I may say something to uh, really pique your interest in how the Bible has come down to us. We have the Bible in a number of different translations. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but personally, I think that is good. You may disagree with that, but the biggest plus having to do with our recent translations is they are based on the earliest Bible manuscripts that we have. The older translations are based on the later manuscripts the newest translations are based on the earliest manuscripts. I will speak about manuscripts having to do with both Old and New Testaments, mainly the New Testament, but some certainly on the Old Testament and some things having to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then work toward the question, which books belong in the Bible? Now, there's a word that stands for that, and that's the word canon, C-A-N-O-N, not C-A-N-N-O-N, but C-A-N-O-N. That is, do we have the right books in the Bible, and why do we have these books, and so forth, and that'll be what we'll be working toward. I want to begin with... Uh, a couple of things. First, I think I ought to tell you how I got interested in this subject. I was teaching a Bible class, a ladies' Bible class, when I was in my early 20s. And the ladies came to class and uh, they had seen a weekly publication, a weekly magazine. And in big print, it said 150,000 errors in the New Testament. They asked me about this. I honestly don't know what I answered at that time. <laughs> but I began to study it. And I want you to know, I say in the humblest way possible, I had the opportunity at Duke University while working on a Ph.D. degree there in biblical studies. I had the opportunity to work under one of the two Americans that was in Jerusalem when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
One of these two was Dr. William Brownlee. I took Hebrew and under him, and he had us read from the photographs of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was a wonderful opportunity. My major professor at Duke University was one of the leading persons in all the world on Greek New Testament manuscripts. And we collated manuscripts. And so, you know, God works in wondrous ways, His wonders to perform. And there, I didn't know exactly how to answer that question. 150,000 errors in the New Testament. Thanks be to God. Now, I know that's not so. And I want to tell you something of that story. I also want to refer to the discovery of the Sinaitic manuscript. Our Bible today is based on manuscripts. A manuscript is anything written with a hand. Now we only have the perfection of the printing press as far back as about 1450. And before then, everything had to be copied by hand, copied by hand. 14th century manuscripts, 13th, 12th, 11th, 10th, 9th, all the way back. How do we know that we have the correct Bible? How do we know these have been accurately copied through all these centuries? Well, there are ways of knowing. But I want to tell you, as I'm turning here, I, I want to read about Tischendorf's discovery of this great manuscript that is called the Sinaitic Manuscript. It's usually called Codex Sinaiticus. He made this discovery in 1859. Who was Tischendorf? A great Bible believer. He spent his years traveling in Europe and in America lecturing on how and why people could believe the Bible. He was the most honored scholar in the 19th century. You know, it's not just ignorant people that believe the Bible. <laughs> Tischendorf tells how he found this scientific manuscript that you now can see in the British Library in London. He was at the monastery there at Sinai, and I'll show you pictures of this. He'd been walking with a person in the monastery, and this man came back to his room, and he said, and I too have a Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so, after saying this, so saying, he took down from the corner of the room a bulky kind of volume wrapped up in a red cloth and laid it before me. This is Tischendorf telling the story. I unrolled the cover and discovered, to my great surprise, not only those very fragments, which 15 years before I had taken out of the basket. He had been there in 1844, but was only allowed to take with him a small number of sheets. He came back again, and now the third time, looking for this, the rest of this manuscript, but he found it here. Much of the Old Testament the New Testament complete, the Sinaitic manuscript is the oldest manuscript, is from the fourth century. It is the oldest that has the complete New Testament. Also, he says, the epistle of Barnabas, part of the shepherd of Hermas. This has to do with canon. Barnabas didn't really write this, and it never was really considered canonical, and the Shepherd of Hermas was written too late. Well, it goes on to say, rather than continue with the quotation, he took the manuscript back in his room, and once he got back in the, in the room, he began to copy the manuscript, stayed up all night copying the manuscript, 
and eventually was able to obtain it from the monastery there. Make a long story short, it went to what we now refer to as Russia. And Russia during the communist period was not interested in this type of manuscript. And it was sold to the British people. And it's now in the, what well, was in the British Museum, but it's now the British Library in London. So let's begin now with the slide presentation. I want to show you a number of things and try to illustrate in pictures how the Bible has come down to us. 150,000 areas in the New Testament. Well, we'll talk about that. And these are the topics that we're going to talk about. Writing and writing materials. The New Testament and its manuscripts. Papyri. Now that's plural for papyrus manuscripts. Vellum uncials. Vellum is a fine kind of animal skin. Uncials are capital letter manuscripts. Vellum cursives, these are written cursively. Illuminated manuscripts, we're going to raise the question, is the New Testament reliable? Then a little bit on the Old Testament manuscripts, including some things on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And finally, the canon, which books belong in the Bible? I always want to start out like this. Suppose people were writing like this in the time of Moses. They were not. The Bible, before, as we know it, would have to have some kind of alphabetic script before the Bible could really be written. These are hieroglyphs. The Egyptians never developed an alphabet. They were very intelligent. But alphabetic scripts had to be developed, and we now know that alphabetic scripts go back before the time of Moses. It used to be said 150 years ago that people didn't even know how to write in the time of Moses. Radical scholars said this, but Bible-believing people uh, believe to the contrary. Writing and writing materials, let's deal with briefly. We're looking at a clay tablet. The date is 3100 B.C. Listening to Mike a while, while ago. You know how far we can trace writing back? Only to the period of 3000 to 4000 B.C. That's as far as you can trace writing back. This is a picture tablet. It was read from top to bottom. Look at the right side. It's read vertically. Now let me ask you a question. Suppose we turn the tablet around and then we read it. We read it from left to right. That's the way we read books today and that's the way we write from left to right. It goes back to these tablets long ago. We have all kinds of tablets. Do you know about Ashurbanipal? In the Old Testament, he's referred to as Osnapper. Osnapper. Ezra 4 refers to him by that name. There are thousands of clay tablets in the British Museum now from the library of Ashurbanipal. These clay tablets were written on when soft, allowed to dry, and then became a wonderfully permanent writing surface. There were all types of shapes. There were shapes in barrels. A lot of the Chronicles of Kings of the Assyrians used this shape uh, tablet. Could put a lot of material on a barrel-shaped tablet. This is the Chronicle of the Assyrian King Sargon II. This one, it so happens tells about the fall of Samaria, that is the capital of the northern kingdom, about 722 B.C. All kinds of things were written on old Hebrew writing, on potsherds, on broken pieces of pottery. And you see here the date is about 8th 
or 7th century B.C. And these are things that were found rather recently. Two silver amulets worn around the neck when they're stretched out. You see it says an er the earliest inscription with a scripture text. And what does this say? This is what this says, 7th century B.C. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and give you peace. From Numbers chapter 6, written on in silver, that far back. Now, the, one of the earliest examples of an alphabetic script found about 50 miles from the traditional site of Mount Sinai. Isn't it interesting that right where the law was given, close by, we have an alphabetic kind of script in the time of Moses. And here's one earlier than the time of Moses found in Egypt. Oh, but it wasn't done by Egyptians. They think it was done by Semites. And it's dated about 1800 B.C. Examples of writing on stone. On the left, the Geezer calendar, agricultural calendar about the time of Solomon. On the right, the Moabite stone. I took this picture in the Louvre in Paris, way down in a dark hallway. This stone tells about the uh, uh, revolt of Mesha, king of Moab against Israel, but I'm showing this as examples of writing on stone. We know the Ten Commandments were written on stone. Another stone inscription, you perhaps have heard about the wonderful discovery of what is called the Siloam inscription about Hezekiah's uh, building a tunnel to convey water from outside of Jerusalem into the city, 700 B.C., and take a look at this. This is a recent discovery. Ink on plaster, about 700 B.C. Look at how the uh, text is lined. Even the margins are marked in red. And guess what the words of this text are? It's in Aramaic, found on a temple wall. And the first words are, the record of Balaam, and Balaam is referred to, as you recall, in Numbers 22, about 700 B.C. Look at this statuette of an Egyptian scribe. Notice his eyes. He's ready to take dictation. Notice his writing materials on his lap. They didn't have desks for a long time or tables. Uh, notebooks were on a person's knee. The papyrus plant that formerly grew in, uh, in, along the River Nile uh, to a height of 10 or 15 feet, the stalks were cut down from the thin layers. They were placed crosswise, and a beautiful writing material was developed from the papyrus plant. Of course, every time we use the word paper, the paper, the word paper itself goes back to the papyrus plant. The New Testament was written on papyrus. The Greek word that is used is cartes. Our English words chart and charter go back to this particular word. And there's another word that I think that you'll find interesting, biblos. Biblos is another term for the papyrus plant. Our word Bible goes back to the papyrus plant. A slide showing how the papy papyrus fibers were placed crosswise, pressed together. This happens to be uh, dark in color because the soil in which it was found uh, uh, contributed to the color of the papyrus, the papyrus sheet. New Testament manuscripts, papyrus manuscripts, 
We know our New Testament was written on papyrus sheets and papyrus rolls. Today we have about a hundred papyri of the New Testament. As I will point out, the New Testament was written in the period of 50 to 100 A.D., and we have papyri going back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries. We have about 30 papyri going back to the 2nd and 3rd centuries. I want to talk about papyrus manuscripts. In the John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester, this uh, library, the John Rylands Library, it has, and there's an inside photo of this beautiful library, the oldest known portion of the New Testament from John 18. Now, we're only seeing one side of the writing. There's writing on the other side. That means this was originally from a codex. A codex is not a scroll, but it's a book form. And from John 18, and guess how many differences there are from this written, uh, well, it was written maybe the last part of the first century, but first part of the second century. Guess how many differences there are? E-I instead of I-E. And another place, I-E instead of E-I. Just spelling differences. You see, we can take a small portion and lay our Greek Testament by this and we can know how the Bible has been copied all through the centuries. I worked with this particular uh, uh, manuscript, uh, papyrus, uh, in the Cambridge University Library from the 3rd century. This is part of Romans 8, and that's what I did, just lay my Greek Testament by the side of the papyrus sheet. For a long time, I have taught at Abilene Christian a course on the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, I refer to as the heart of Hebrews. And this fragment in the Cambridge University Library is part of Hebrews 9. Now, you see, we can tell a lot. Originally, this was a, a big manuscript, but only a little bit has survived. But from a little bit, we can tell a whole lot about our Bible text. Bible languages I have not explained. The New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and there are some sections of it in Aramaic. For example, when you're in Daniel 2, 4, the last part of Daniel 2, 4 starts in Aramaic and goes all the way through chapter 7. By the way, we have Dead Sea scroll, scroll manuscripts that confirm this going from Hebrew into Aramaic at just this precise place, and then going back to Hebrew at the end of chapter 7 uh, in, Dan in Daniel. Here is a portion of Paul's letters. This is the earliest copy of Paul's letters that we have. Part of this is in the University Library University of Michigan, and part of it's in Dublin, Ireland. The date is about A.D. 200. Notice there's no spacing between the words. All the words were written together in these early copies. Jack Finnegan, the great archaeologist, said, here is our oldest copy of Paul's letters, and it emphatically confirms the accuracy and soundness of the general textual tradition. We're not talking about 150,000 eras in the New Testament. That's not so. Vellum manuscripts. I'll show you pictures of Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and some others. Constantine Tischendorf, I read from a while ago. Tischendorf was 29 years old when he came to St. Catherine's Monastery looking for manuscripts. This is a stylized picture of Tischendorf as a young scholar. And there is the monastery. We were there some years ago, and it's 
quite an impressive place. It was built in the 500s. Where can you go and see anything that was built in the 500s? It has not been disturbed. No earthquake, no war has ever gone through there. And it is pretty much as it was built by the Emperor Justinian back then. St. Catherine's Monastery. And then some various views around the monastery. Uh, I might mention it's so-called uh, St. Catherine's because Catherine was a Christian who died as a martyr. And then the monastery was named for her. What are you looking at here? The burning bush at Sinai. Now, what did I know? I thought the burning bush had burned. <laughs> but monks will show you this is the burning bush, and they say a certain time of the year it puts out red berries. Well, this is not the burning bush, but that's, that's what they tell you. Now, what about these handsome creatures? We should have had Mike up here talking about this and explaining all about this. We went into the brother's room, and we asked them, why this? And they said, we want to be together in the morning of the resurrection. <laughs> I don't think our being together in the morning of the resurrection depends on this kind of thing. But they buried their monks out in the, in the cemetery, and after 10 or 15 years, they'd bring their skulls in to the brother's room. Tischendorf made three trips to Sinai, 1844, 1853, 1859. It was 1859 when he found the Sinaitic manuscript. And these are other scenes around the monastery that I took when I was there. This is the modern British library. We were disappointed when we saw it. It is so modern looking, but it's only been built three or four years. Uh, much better to see the British Museum as it has been for, for, for a long time. But in the British Library, that's where you can find the copy that Tischendorf found. Now, Tischendorf, it was not bound when, when Tischendorf found it. Codex Sinaiticus. Remember, Codex means a leaf book, not a scroll. And here's a, the close-up of Codex Sinaiticus. I want you to notice the writing, how clear it is. There is no question about what the reading was. Fourth century, but as I said, we have third century manuscripts, we have second century manuscripts, and the New Testament was written in the first century. This is Codex Alexandrinus, a fifth century copy of the Gospels, uh, well, in, in, of, the New of the New Testament, uh, really. Codex Alexandrinus. It did not come to England until uh, 1627. The Sinaitic manuscript was not discovered until 1859. In the Vatican Library, now, the last when we were there last year, they don't even have the tables as shown here. I took this some years ago. But there are so many people going through the Vatican now to see the Sistine Chapel. They've just kind of rolled all this aside. This is the Vatican Library. It used to be that the Vatican manuscript was under glass. We had a guide there, and if you don't mind my saying so, uh, I, I was wanting to see the Vatican manuscript, and there it was under glass. And I started reading the Greek text there. It was from 2 Corinthians. And this guide, <laughs> he said, well, he'd been a guide 40 years. He'd never seen anybody could read that manuscript. <laughs> well, let's go back up. Hit the state. There's, the, there's the Codex Vaticanus, Vaticanus, three columns to the page, very clear writing. And when I was at Cambridge University, uh, I, after working there for some months, I asked the librarian, I said, you know, I teach a course in textual criticism of the Greek text. I don't know anyone that would enjoy seeing Codex Biza more than I. And she said, just wait here. And so the keeper of the manuscripts came out. He took me back to the back. This is Codex Biza. And uh, it's, uh, 
a beautiful manuscript, and I just turned through it. The vellum is very thin, and Mr. White knew more about the Latin text, which is on the right. I knew more about the Greek text, and we had quite a conversation about Codex Biza. This is a palimpsest. That's the underneath writing. See the underneath writing here? The underneath writing in a manuscript is the more important one, more important because it's the earliest. It's called a palimpsest manuscript. We were on the Isle of Patmos some years ago, and this is the purple, purple vellum manuscript called Codex Purpius, uh, most of which is on the Isle of Patmos today. This is what a cursive or minuscule manuscript looks like. It's a small letter manuscript, and that's why it's called a minuscule manuscript. I want to talk about Jerome's Latin Vulgate. In the West, the Latin text was what was copied for a thousand years. In the East, it was the Greek text that was copied. I want to emphasize that Jerome, when he made the Vulgate about 400, A.D. 400, he did not base it on the Greek. He based it on the Latin. From the Vulgate, those such words that we use all the time, from the Vulgate have come such words as congregation, conversion, exhortation, justification, testament, sanctification, on and on. Even our word Calvary is from the Latin Vulgate. Notice the last point. This is the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church Bible is based on Latin. It is not based on the original Greek, where our translations are based on the original manuscripts. That is, the original language is Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. A representation of Jerome, his Latin Vulgate, about A.D. 400. That's called a miniature of Jerome handing out copies of his Latin Vulgate. Our word miniature means small, but the word miniature for many centuries simply referred to a painting, the painting in a book. And so it's called a miniature. Now, let's talk about illuminated manuscripts. The Lindisfarne Gospels, briefly, the Book of Kells that you may know about, and then some others. In the British Library, this beautiful manuscript that was copied about 695 with the beautiful illuminations. This is a, uh, a representation of Matthew. Notice Matthew's symbol above his head. His symbol is a man or an angel. This is in Latin manuscripts. Only in much later Greek manuscripts are these symbols used. Uh, the symbol uh, of a man or angel for Matthew. The symbol of a lion for Mark. The symbol of a calf or ox for Luke. And the symbol of an eagle for John. Now, typically in medieval manuscripts, you would have portraits of the evangelist. You'd have the pictures of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'd have Matthew... Matthew's picture, and then you'd have the book of Matthew. And then you'd have Mark's picture, and then you'd have the book of Mark, and so forth. This is another uh, photo from the Lindisfarne Gospels, so-called, because it was copied on an island just off of the coast of northeast England. Count the dots on that page. Someone has, there are more than 10,000 red dots on that sheet. Why do they spend so much time doing this sort of thing? One reason, they wanted to adorn the wonderful Word of God. Across carpet page, and look at the intricacy of the design. How did they ever do anything like that? And look at the patience required, the time. Look at the intricacy of it. And... What is known as the most beautiful book in the world, the book of Kells. Here are some uh, photos from Kells. This is the Beatitudes from Kells. And a close-up of the book of Kells. This is now in uh, Dublin, Ireland, Trinity College. Look again at the details in this close-up. 
It's actually part of the letter Q that you're looking at. From the British Library, a luxurious manuscript that once was all done in gold. Only two pieces, only two leaves have survived. This is one of the leaves. And what are we looking at here? Mark. Notice what is at his ear. What? A dove. What does a dove represent? The Holy Spirit. Why is the dove at his ear? Indicating inspiration of God as Mark wrote his gospel. This is an illumination of John. You see the uh, eagle on the desk. Now, they didn't have desk when John made his uh, gospel of John. This is a medieval uh, representation of it. And so you could even see the eagle there on top of the desk. You, you know, it's uh, a representation of John. Other illuminated manuscripts I'll pass by uh, quickly. This is the picture Bible. I once was uh, asked to write an article for a Bible dictionary on Biblia Pauperum. This is the poor man's Bible. And they did it in pictures because most people could not read. Is the New Testament text reliable? Are there 150,000 errors in the New Testament? Now look. A Greek text. This is a critical Greek text. This is what translators translate when they translate the Bible today. I want you to see what the evidence is. At the bottom of the page is what is called an apparatus. That gives you the different readings of, different man, of various manuscripts. You see the 10 there? I, I, maybe you can see 10. Right by the 10, there's a Greek letter that means far. And it tells you what manuscripts have far. Then on down, it says, but now the text, TXT, without the far, is found in manuscript B, that's the Vatican manuscript. It's found in Aleph, that's the Sinaitic manuscript. It's found in D, that's Biza, and some others. There's all the evidence. In fact, if we will just look right down the line, the next thing we have toward the end is the Greek definite article. What's the kind of thing that you do when you uh, make a mistake in writing a letter or in copying something? Well, it's just a little thing. You might leave out a letter or leave out a word or misspell a word. This is the kind of, quote, errors. That's what they were talking about, 150,000 errors in the New Testament. That just shows how little they knew about it. They're never called errors. They are called textual variants. V-A-R-I-A-N-T-S. They're never called textual errors. And it's not a matter of errors. It's simply how, whether it's Herod the king or the king Herod or something like that. Now, when you're reading your Bible... Look down at the bottom of the page, and sometimes it'll say, other authorities say. And they let you know the different readings of the manuscripts. And you have at your disposal everything that you need to know about uh, the reading of the text. And that's true whether it's New Testament text or Old Testament text. Quickly, on the Old Testament, there are two model codices of the Old Testament I want to show you pictures of these model codices. One is the Aleppo Codex that formerly was in Aleppo, Syria. Arabs raided the synagogue there in 1947 and destroyed part of this manuscript. But fortunately, it is now in Jerusalem, and uh, much of it has survived and is being used as a part of the new critical uh, Hebrew text, the text on the Hebrew Bible. What we have in St. Petersburg in Russia is a complete copy of the Old Testament, not anything lost at all. It's called the Leningrad Codex, 
Notice the date, though. 1010. Well, how can we be sure that the Old Testament was accurately copied? Well, there are a lot of things. You know, you really have to study about this. There are a lot of things to find out about this. Oh, and there is a, a sheet of the uh, Leningrad Codex. But what can we do? We can go to the Dead Sea. There is the young man that first found the Dead Sea Scrolls, Muhammad Adib. At Qumran, you've heard about Qumran. Maybe some of you have been there. That's the excavation at Qumran. This is where we think the scrolls were copied. Writing instruments were found in this large room, and so it's called the scriptorium. Right in the middle of the picture is cave four. Circled, manuscripts, every book of the Old Testament, manuscripts have been found of every book, with the exception of the book of Esther, from that one cave. There are 11 caves that had the immediate finds, and then many more caves thereafter. And so there have been just many, many, many copies of the Bible text, a lot of them complete, a lot of them incomplete, but the incomplete ones can tell us very much about the text. I wondered why they hadn't found these things before. All those dark areas, those are caves. There are hundreds of caves above the Dead Sea. And this is a photo from one of the caves. And this is what is called a wadi. A wadi is a kind of a dry creek, rip, creek bed uh, that uh, carries water uh, at the time it rains, but not much rain along the Dead Sea. Wadi Qumran. Today in Jerusalem, I know a number of you have been there. You've been in the shrine of the book. Notice the top of the shrine of the book in the shape of a jar in which the scrolls were originally found. And we had special permission to take pictures in the uh, museum and in the uh, shrine of the book. And around this drum was originally stretched the Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scroll that goes back to about 150 B.C. Now they have replaced that because the stretching around the drum was actually damaging the manuscript. And so they have a facsimile copy of the Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls but they, and are keeping the other one uh, safely. This is the Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dr. Brownlee had us reading from the photographs of this manuscript. And another one called the Habakkuk Commentary. Now notice that's different kind of writing that circled. Old Hebrew writing was used for the name of God called the Tetragrammaton the name that no one really knows how to pronounce, whether Jehovah or Yahweh or what. But they used a special form of writing for this special name for God. A scribe copying a manuscript. Uh, one uh, weekend uh, when I was doing work under Dr. Brownlee, I wanted to know for my own research uh, how many variants, not eras, how many variants there were between this manuscript and our modern Hebrew text? I counted 37 variants in one chapter. But you know what? Only three were large enough to be translated. The rest of them were simply spelling differences. And let me show you now the kind of difference from the Dead Sea Scrolls and our modern Hebrew text. This is one of the differences. The Dead Sea Scrolls says, holy, holy. Our modern Hebrew text says, holy, holy, holy. Our modern Hebrew text, without exception, is a better text than in the Isaiah Scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, at least in chapter 6. And then if you look at your Bibles, there will be a note at the down at the bottom in Isaiah, it'll say sometimes one ancient 
manuscript reads, and it's usually talking about the Isaiah manuscript of the Dead Sea Scrolls. F.F. F. Bruce said, the new evidence that's on Isaiah and these other manuscripts confirms what we had already good evidence to believe, that the Jewish scribes of the early Christian centuries copied and recopied the text of the Hebrew Bible with the utmost of fidelity. Well, that's how we can know something about how the Bible has been conveyed down to our times. What books belong in the Bible? Canon. Now, you need to make a study of this. Uh, I tell students, uh, you know, we can't just give some easy answers to some of these things. Uh, so, uh, study this, study this uh, about early translations, uh, our recent translations, and so forth. Which books belong in the Bible? Canon is from the Greek word kanon. With reference to the Bible, the word denotes the list of books received as Holy Scripture. So if we say something is canonical, we say it's in the Bible. That is, that is it's a part of Holy Scripture. If it's non-canonical or uncanonical, then it is not a part of the canon. It's not a part of the list of Holy Scripture. For example, our Old Testament canon contains 39 books. Why these 39? Number one, remember the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Number two, the, key, the Hebrew canon has 39 books. No more, no less. Number three, when Jesus and the apostles quote the Old Testament, they always quote from these books. Fourth, this Hebrew canon of what we have, 39 books, counted differently by them, 22 or sometimes 24, but that was just... It's referring to our same 39. They counted, for example, where we count 12 minor prophet books, they counted that as one book. But this same canon is the canon of Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, of Origen, the great Christian scholar, about A.D. 200, and of Jerome, who even did the Latin Vulgate, the man that did the Latin Vulgate on which the Roman Catholic Bible is based did not believe that the Apocrypha ought to be a part of Scripture. All he did was just base uh, his conclusions on the basis of the Hebrew, and he said the Apocrypha does not have the Hebrew verity. That was his expression. When was the Old Testament canon fixed? at least by the time of Jesus, and probably much earlier. Things to consider. The Old Testament was written over a period of many centuries. We know this. Is that right? Another thing to remember. A complete collection of Old Testament books would likewise take many centuries. Still another point, were there not discussions and debates about various books in the Old Testament? Yes, about the Song of Solomon, for example, or about Esther, or maybe about Ecclesiastes. You've heard of the Council of Jamnia? They just discussed these books. They didn't change anything, didn't change anything. Yes, there were discussions, but no books were added or subtracted. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have a Bible that was discussed and uh, weighed one way or the other back you know, in the first century and second century and third century. Uh, uh, Non-canonical things never were accepted. The, I'll, I'll talk more about the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, these things were never accepted. Gnosticism was a heresy, and that in spite of, um, well, I know everybody has read the Da Vinci Code, in spite of what the Da Vinci Code says. 
Now an important point. We should distinguish between the canonicity of a book and the authority of that book. Think about it. A book written by a prophet or an apostle was authoritative at the moment it was written. It would take some time for it to be included in a list of inspired books. The New Testament canon consists of 27 letters or books, inspired and authoritative at the time they were written. Our New Testament was written sometime during the period of A.D. 50 to 100. Now Paul says, for example, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, let a person acknowledge that what I'm writing is the command of the Lord. It was the command of the Lord when he wrote it. It would take a while for it to be circulated and to make the list in order for it to be regarded as canonical, but it was authoritative when Paul wrote it. When was the New Testament canon fixed? One, mostly by about A.D. 200. Two, discussions and debates continued in some areas of the church about some of the books. I mentioned Hebrews. I've been teaching Hebrews for years. Hebrews is one of those that was discussed, debated. Why? Weren't sure who wrote it. Or James. They weren't sure whether it was the, uh, James the Apostle or James the Lord's brother or who it was that wrote it. But I'm glad that they had discussions about these sort of things. Suppose we have discussions about this today. I always discuss the canonicity of Hebrews when I'm teaching Hebrews. When I discuss its canonicity, that does not take away from its authority. We can study about the canonicity of any book, and they could study about the canonicity of their books. Their studying it, debating it, discussing it doesn't take away from the authority of the particular book. Three. Always the question to be decided was whether a book was written by an apostle or by an associate of an apostle. In the case of Matthew, an apostle. In the case of Mark, an associate of Paul, an associate of Peter. In the case of Luke, a very close associate of Paul. In the case of John, an apostle. These things were rather easily resolved, and it had very much to do with what was canonical and what was not. Four, in A.D. 367, Athanasius published a list of 27 books that is exactly the same as our New Testament today. You say, who was Athanasius? A great leader in the church. In that period of time, a leader in the church who lived uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria. Of these 27 books, Athanasius says at that time, these, the 27, are the springs of salvation. Let no one add anything to them or take any way, anything away from them. And let the congregation say, Amen. Number one question, what about the Apocrypha? Now the Apocrypha are the books that are in the Roman Catholic Old Testament that are not in our Protestant Bibles. What about the Apocrypha? Answer, they were never a part of the Hebrew canon. Our translation of the Old Testament is based on the Hebrew. The Apocrypha was never written in Hebrew. They were not a part of the Hebrew canon. Question two, what about the so-called Gnostic Gospels? Answer, not a single one of them, not a single one of them was ever considered a part of the Bible. Now, if you've read the Da Vinci Code, the guy says there are thousands of manuscripts 
That's all untrue. Thousands of manuscripts that show that uh, Jesus uh, was mar married and, he, and had this child. The statement is made. There are thousands of manuscripts. You know how many manuscripts there are? Watch me. <laughs> Zero. We have to be very careful about what we read and what we believe. And yet, the whole world has gone after, you know, this. Thanks be to God, not the whole world. All right, what about the apocryphal gospels? I'm bringing this to a conclusion. You know the best thing to do? You read these gospels yourself. So-called gospels. Where can you read them? Well, a convenient arrangement is in the Apocryphal New Testament, edited by J.K. Eliot. Because of their fanciful tales, the infancy gospel of Thomas, Jesus is playing, a child bumps into him, and Jesus strikes him dead. You want to believe that? You believe that ought to be a part of your Bible? Uh, from the Acts of John, so-called Acts of John. John comes into an inn, and there are bed bugs in the bed, and John commands the bed bugs to get out of the bed, and they get out of the bed, and they march in a line out of the room. <laughs> you want that in your Bible? <laughs> Acts of Paul. Listen to this. Paul baptizes a lion, L-I-O-N, <laughs> baptizes a lion, and later this lion saves him in the amphitheater. <laughs> what about the Protevangelion of James? That's an early one, oh, last part of the second century, not nearly early enough to be in our Bible. Well, it was written to... Uh, perpetuate, perpetuate the idea of, of uh, Mary as a virgin, um, well, the perpetual virginity of, of Mary. Says that she was placed in the temple at the age of three. That angels fed her uh, in the temple from the age of three. That is the Protevangelion of James. Now, because of their fanciful tales, they have excluded themselves from the canon of Scripture. You know, the best thing to do is just read some of those things, and I tell you what, you'll come hurrying back to your Bible. <laughs> Thanks be to God who inspired the books of the Bible and has preserved them through the centuries for us. The real test of the canon is whether we ourselves will choose to obey it. Are we going to follow the teachings of Christ and the apostles as we have in the canon? Whether we will follow the authoritative teachings that we have in our sacred scripture. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. This has been How We Got Our Bible, presented by Neil Lightfoot. To receive a free catalog of all of our Bible study DVDs, CDs, audio tapes, and books, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach, call 800 977 2177 24 hours a day or on the web at compass.org.